gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Abraham Francis. Abe Francis is Deer Clan from the Aquasasne and the current program manager for the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne Environment Program. He earned a B Bachelor of Science in Microbiology and a Master's of Science in Natural Resources from Cornell University. Previous positions held for the Mohawk Council of Aquasasne included the Community Health Representative, Prevention and Intervention Coordinator, Environmental Project Coordinator, and Environmental Science Officer. So Abe, I'll turn it over to you. So Sego Sego Guego, um, appreciate that introduction, John, um, and appreciate the opportunity to present at this conference. Um, <laughs> I think we're all sick of Zoom, but you know I appreciate uh, such a wonderful um, community coming out to listen. And <clears throat> so I just am going to like jump right into it, and I will share what it is that I'm looking at here. Um, all right. So um, basically what I'm here to, to share with y'all is a bit about what I'm working with and how it's connected to the river and give you a bit of background on Akwazasne, what we represent, where I'm coming from, how I sort of approach all my work from a community centered approach. And it's sort of based, it's based on my understanding of everything that we are. So Gunyo uh, Dalawana, is um, Mohawk for the St. Lawrence River. And Akuzaslono is for is a word we use for Akuzaslono community members. And so there's this really beautiful connection between my community and the river. And this has existed since time immemorial. And really what like Akuzaslono used to represent is kind of this highway that connected the St. Lawrence across New York State and even into like the broader areas of Ontario, you know, it just connected us so well. Um, it was a great place where my people historically to come fish, hunt, trade. Um, but it wasn't until like 1755 that my community, a group of 100 Mohawks moved from Ganawaga down here and established our, our made like a permanent settlement here. And what you'll see here in this corner um, is Ganatical or the St. Ridges or St. Ridges. Um, and that's kind of where it all began um for our community and i'll share a bit more so whenever i start these conversations i like to talk about um mary tebow and this kind of goes back to like my background in forest stewardship um which is what i got like my master what my master's thesis focused on but what i really love about this is what you see in her face is so much joy and and that she's she's crafting this beautiful basket, which is such a major tradition here um, that provided for our community in times that there really wasn't much economic opportunity around here. So what's beautiful about this story is it also represents resilience because she was jailed two times uh, for 90 days um, for, for not giving up her Canadian citizenship. And, and the reason that she refused to sort of give it up and become an American per se was that she was, um, she was like, was a slow no. Um, we're not a part of Canada or the United States. We have to operate within these colonial systems to live our lives, which in our case, in Akwazasne leads to quite complicated, which is like a complicated jurisdictional nightmare. But sometimes I, I, I also like to see it as this jurisdictional opportunity. Um, to do really innovative stuff. And so just to like for Akwazasne, um, we're a part of the Mohawk Nation, which is a part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And what you see here is five nations, but we're actually six nations. Um, so we're the Tuscarora, the Seneca, the Cayuga, Anadaga, Oneida, and the Mohawks. And the Mohawks represent the Eastern door. And Akwazasne is actually the holder of the fire for the Mohawk Nation, kind of like the capital. Um, so there's a lot of really like interesting history that actually exists here about that connection. And I also like to share what, like give a little bit of context of how we fit into and what was our sort of historical landscape. Um, and as you can see, it was quite massive and expanded even beyond the borders of New York State um, and into Canada. And actually it's, much larger than this. Um, 
And this is just to give you a sense of like who we are in Akwasasana and the jurisdictional nightmare that I'm talking about. So my, my position as the Mohawk Council Environmental Services Manager is I, a lot of my work revolves around this river, but as you can see, it's very necessary. So I operate in the Northern portion of the community and that's where my jurisdiction is, what would be Canada. Um, and then in the Southern portion, there's the Sabre just Mohawk tribe, which is kind of the US portion, but we really work close together. And all of my work is really focused on treating my community as a single community, a united place. And for me, that's really paying homage and respect to who I am because I was born and raised here. And ultimately I will be buried here and raise my children here. And so the work I do and what I'm trying to do here is about protecting this environment for them. And so like giving a little bit more context on that like complex jurisdictional nightmare, right? So I, I give you a bit of background on the St. Regis Mohawk tribe, a bit of background on the Mohawk Council of Akwazasne, but the Mohawk Nation Council of Chiefs is sort of the organization or the is a traditional governance system that exists here and operates across the community. And then we, like I said, Mohawk Council in the Northern portion, St. Regis Mohawk tribe in the Southern portion. But these two were our imposed colonial structures in our community. It's not to say like that it's, they are beneficial. We've, wor we've worked hard to claim and assert ourselves and assert our sovereignty within these systems. But also there is a lot of animosity that we have to unpack in that relationship from the community members. There's a lot of distrust with the Canadian and American governments. And historically, I think we can understand why. So from the political ecology of fishing in Akwazasana, and this is just a little like note to um, bring it to the river. Um, so for us, the border was laid down with the Treaty of Paris. The thing that sort of gave us or sort of established Akwazasana in the way it is, is the Seven Nations Treaty. Um, and then there was like, you know, the like the border really wasn't enforced back then. Um, but it wasn't until like the War of 1812 that this border became more enforced. But I mean, you know, United States and Canada fighting, of course, they're going to have a major thing to say. Um, <clears throat> but also a pretty major, a pretty important moment happened here in Akwazasne, right in Benadigo, between the U.S. Uh, Calvary and the Canadian, uh, and a Canadian fort. Um, and so in 1869, that was in the Indian Act was imposed upon us. And in opposition to this, because what's interesting about this relationship with Akazasana is we actually weren't, we've, we removed ourselves from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy um, because the Haudenosaunee Confederacy had um, launched our, had a war going. And so we removed ourselves and we didn't rejoin the Confederacy until 1888. So I always find that, that to be so, so interesting. Um, and then, you know, immediately after that, we had the Indian Advancement Act. Um, <clears throat> and this was sort of, this was complementary to um, the, like a variety of different acts that sort of forced these, these uh, governments on us and sort of promoted that idea of assimilationist um, perspectives. Um, but also like, as we kind of move forward, there was the St. Regis Islands Act, um, the Wildlife Conservation Act. And what I'm just sort of saying is like, there are these various moves that we've made to assert ourselves. So the conservation a law is actually a law from Akwazasana that we established and asserts our sovereignty over this area. And then what I'd like to draw attention to is the Adams case in 1996, because the Canadian government tried to say that we didn't have any uh, fishing rights in this area, which we do. And now we have we have a case that supports that. And so I also like to bring in this part of the narrative too, the degrading of the ecological relationships within our history. And so <clears throat> for me, like this, a lot of this begins even before this um, in the 1800s, 1700s. Um, <clears throat> but in really for our river where this connects is in 1954 to 1957, that's when the St. Lawrence Seaway project happened. And our community wasn't consulted, wasn't engaged, <clears throat> and we lost we lost land. The hydrology of this area was changed. Um, species populations were lost to like in and the extent that they were historically, such as the eel. <clears throat> and then what it did is it also drew industry to this area for cheap energy. 
So we had this really concentrated industrial sector right at the edge of our community. And a lot for me, I like to talk about environmental violence and how this manifested itself implicated us as a community. And so a large part of my work connects to the area of areas of concern, which is this really complex thing between the North and the South. We have two of them. And what I'm doing is I'm working with a, with a really amazing colleague to try to bring those efforts together. Because if we're like, if we're doing work on one side and not on the other side, and we're not communicating, it's, it's complicated. Well, because of that, all of these contaminants ended up in the environment. And it wasn't until 1978 that the program I work for and lead now um, started sampling fish. And that was when we noted that there was toxic levels of lead, PCBs. Um, actually, it was focused on lead, mercury, and PCBs that for, are for a while. But there was a lot of other chemicals within the ecosystem that were of concern in those areas. And so it wasn't until 1984, that was when these areas of concern efforts started to move forward. TM became a super fun site. Um, in 1986, the tribe in the southern portion put out their cease consumption. And that was kind of off the tail end of MCA saying no consumption. And actually, we had the same, we had the same um, suggestion, no consumption. We've had the same one since like 1979. And in 1998 to 2013, there was a ridiculous amount of research that happened here around the health, Im health implications of environmental violence on our people's bodies. Um, disruption of um, menstruation, um, disruption of thyroid, um, testosterone. There were so many things that happened to this. And, and my community still continues to be extremely concerned about the rates of cancer in our community. But, you know, we're trying to understand this and, and add data and connect the research. Um, but I think one of the more, one of the, my favorite pieces didn't really happen until 2013, which really represented the cultural implications of environmental violence. And this work was done by Elizabeth Hoover. But it wasn't only done by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hoover. It was done by Akwaza Slono before. But I don't, it didn't seem like this really made much of an impact until Elizabeth Hoover wrote about it. But I'm so grateful for her work, she's a magnificent colleague, and she just really put things into words and showed that violence on the land is violence on my people, is violence on our culture, and violence on our languages. We lost pieces of our language in this process. We've lost so much because of this, the disconnect. Um, <clears throat> but what I think is really beautiful is all the work that's been done, the resistance, the resilience, is we got this, this uh, natural resource damages case settlement in 2013, but that was in the U.S., that was in uh, the southern portion with the New York, with the U.S. Uh, District Courts of New York. So we got 20.3 million, but because of our ability to communicate the cultural implications, um, we were able to establish this program called Azaji Dewado. <clears throat> And so in that process, um, we, we established these masters and apprentices relationships, and we taught about fishing, medicines, hunting, trapping, all of these wonderful things really promoted the language. And I'm really grateful for that work. And now what I sort of like to bring in is like the biocultural context of my people and what really informs my work from thinking about methodology, research questions, research approaches, and and a bit of this comes from um, those teachings and stories that are connected to this landscape. So the creation story is one of those um, that like we are directly connected to this landscape through our ontology. And then our cycles of ceremonies is something that really speaks to on an annual basis how we remind ourselves of our roles and responsibilities to creation. And these are, um, I'm trying to remember the, the exact, but phenological indicators are what note this time when we have things. The only time that, um, the only time that sort of follows um, a celestial trajectory is, uh, is our new year. So when the seven dancers are over us, which is the Big Dipper, that is when it's time for us to have midwinter ceremony. And within that, then we can, um, and then we start our year. And then we start our cycles of ceremony um, with the maple, with um, when the thunderers return. There's so much that happens throughout the year. 
And then also thinking about us as a people, we're connected to these, this ecology here. I'm deer clan. And so I'm connected to this place and connected to that species. And there's a lot of like pontification around <laughs> what our, how our clans implicate us um, and the way we are uh, from a temperamental perspective. <laughs> um, and also if we are as like Mohawks, we're really aggressive people. <laughs> Um, which I think is kind of hilarious to talk about. Um, and then I also bring in like the great law, like the great, um, with the Guyana La Goa, Skarnas, Kasusasla, Gaibuhlio, and there's peace, power, and a good mind. And that there's this, this is really about our relationship with each other, ourselves, the world, nations. It's so applicable in so many different ways. And I really think about what does this mean with our relationship with creation around us? And this really leads nicely into the Ohantakali with Dakwa, or the Thanksgiving address, which is this biocultural framework of relationships with the world around us. And we have roles and responsibilities to those aspects of creation. And if we don't fulfill those, then those, those relationships can leave us. And I think that that's kind of species at risk kind of situations in our communities. And this is the entire basis of my program that I currently work in. And I am trying to hit every aspect of this with intention, with, with the way that I develop my work plans and how I choose to develop my budgets and go after project funds. And that's what I'm going to share a bit with you um, through today's presentation is our water work. And, and it may, it's not everything. It's just a, it's a nice taste. Um, and so this is actually the project I started working on when I joined Mohawk Council. And, it, and it's, a really, it's really close to my heart. Um, I, people used to call me the Ganyunda man. <laughs> and I still laugh at that because it's the minnows. Minnows and shorelines in Akwazasne. I spent a lot of time doing sampling and interviews and trying to come up with strategies to understand fish populations during the winter. It was, honestly, it was a a magnificent project that was beyond my years and actually formed the basis of how I, I see doing research um, and really informed it, uh, the way that I did research for my, my master's thesis and will continue to do in my PhD. And so in the fish and nearshore, uh, have um, fish, <laughs> fish identification nearshore surveys. So this is a partnership that we have with the St. Lawrence River Institute of Environmental Science, which is uh, an NGO, um, environmental NGO in, Northern, in um, Cornwall. And we actually Mohawk helped establish that place. And there is just so much cool stuff going on. And this project really st actually started that same year as my project. We worked together to like, they really helped help me put my feet on the ground, and we continue to do this through our agreements with the um, with the Ontario Power Generators. So I think what the Ontario Power Generation is doing is actually helping us kind of correct the wrongs of the past. You know that they're investing in us and the environmental work that needs to be done considering that the dam was a big part of the damages the seaway and you know i gotta approach the seaway at some point um and figure out how they can support us as well um but i think this is all about creating um great partnerships now a little interesting piece about this is we're integrating environmental dna and so we're we're developing these these really amazing directions on how to increase the ability in which we do this and being really innovative. So like in my bio, like when, um, when, when John introduced me at the beginning, microbiology, I love DNA and that I get to do this work now, oh, breaks my heart so happy. I wanna like, I, I, I used to hate the lab, but I kind of miss it now. <laughs> so. This is just amazing work. We have this incredible data set from the last seven years now, are going into our seventh year now. Um, and it's super valuable. It's teaching us so much. And I think what's the interesting piece is that like Aquazosne has the coolest species. So outside of Aquazosne, it's really hard to find like healthy shorelines. Um, but in Aquazosne, our diversity is off the hook and our, our colleagues love to come and sample with us. And then also 
in sort of like a complementary but kind of connected, not really, is the fish contaminant project. Um, so in 2018, 2019, um, the St. Regis Mohawk tribe received funds to clean the Grass River. And the Grass River is located just, just, um, you can you can't totally see it on this map, or yeah, actually you can. Um, can then can you guys see my uh, my mouse, or is that not happening? We can see it. Okay, so right here is a grass river, and upstream of the grass river used to is another was another um, polluter, <laughs> and so the grass river was extremely contaminated. And what they re they receive funds to dredge the entire river and cap it. Um, and there was a lot of concerns about our community because what you can see is like, look, water flows down river, right? And there was concerns about the contaminants making their way into our ecosystem. But also in this process of trying to bring that to awareness, we realized that uh, Canada was not sampling south of Cornwall Island. So there was an entire section of the river that was not being accounted for in the fish, uh, the uh, fish advisories. So we worked with our partners, they hooked us up with some funding. We're just finishing, we just finished our sampling within the last year and sent off all of our fish for um, evaluation. And then we're going to do an analysis and see what kind of recommendation we can give to the community. And a little bit of like my underlying, um, desire in this relationship here is that I was trying to maybe see if there was any indication of ecosystem health impacts from the grass river cleanup. Engineers told us, no, it's not possible, blah, blah, blah. But like, for me, this was really informed by, I, my research questions are informed by my community. Whether their concerns are real or imagined is not, is, I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is finding an answer for them. And so I'm gonna look into it. And that's exactly what I did. Um, and right now we're just kind of in the data analysis and the synthesis business and uh, seeing our next steps. Um, and also within the last year, we got like this really great shoreline project. So what we suffer from in Akwazasana is a lot of shoreline erosion. Um, we do have some shoreline hardening happening here. It's not as prolific as it is outside the territory. Um, we actually have a lot of green spaces along our shorelines and they're pretty healthy, but there's a lot of concerns about erosion from wave action from the large ships that go through our community in particular in this location. Um, but also there's like an accountability for our own people with their boating activities in this territory. And I'm still trying to figure out how to like get in people's brains and remind them of our roles and responsibilities to these rivers, to these lands, to these ecosystems. You know, don't fill in, don't, don't fill in your shorelines. Because remember too, Environment Canada um, and those bodies, they have no jurisdiction here. And so they cannot find people for what we do. That's our responsibility. And that's the, that's the authority that we assert. So it's a creative process. Um, and I just, you know, I'm really about restorative justice. I'm not about dropping the hammer on people. I know that this is just in their minds that they want access to their shorelines, but it's, they're not realizing the impact they're having. So it's my job to educate. And then we also have this amazing partnership with the International Secretariat for Water. And we've run such an amazing series of events, engagements with youth. Um, some of these is roles and responsibilities to Onagasuma. And that was where we just had this really beautiful discussion about um, our connection to water and how should we advocate it, advocate for water. Because it's different than like, non aquas alone, non-Indigenous people would. Like sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we have sovereignty in our communities. And at some points we need to step away from the systems that exist outside of us. Yes, they have implications on us, but sometimes it's not. Like we have to step away and rely on our own, our own systems. Um, and again, there was another event that we had in July, which was our closing event. And it was Aquas Oslono for the future of Ona, um, Onega, Oneganos. And we, we just had this amazing series of presentations and discussions. It was beautiful. We also did a shoreline cleanup. And in this last year, I had gotten funding with the International Secretariat for Water to hire summer students. 
And they came up with these amazing projects. They presented on the importance of pollinators, um, basic species awareness, um, they also did like when, and, and then what we did was at the shoreline cleanup, but we talked about consent. We talked about monitoring and journaling. And like, we really made this beautiful discussion about how consent is connected to the land, mental health, and all these things about making this intimate connection of who we are in connection with the, with the shorelines that exist around us. And so I really appreciate that. And then this is just a little image um from our um from when we launched our when we launched our basically our connection to each other and so i took a group of rock was a slono to montreal and we met we chatted we came up with ideas it was awesome um and then for this one with the international joint commission we been working with them for quite a while now and we've had really great projects come out of it in particular the project that comes that i really love is the um fish consumption framework and it's this 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 collaborative project that's really interested in how do we develop advisories for our community for aquas Slono, um that bring in our our cultural connection bring in population health um the health like how healthy is it to eat fish um and then also like the contaminants so really making advisories holistic and connected to aquas Slono and thinking about the communication that we're going to put in place so it's easily understandable we are, we are subjective, are subjective. Ooh. john could you or somebody okay um and so it's really about communicating information because the fish advisories for our area are so complicated because we're at the intersection of Ontario, Quebec, New York State, and then we have our own. There's a lot going on here and a lot of data that we have to consider. Um, and data doesn't necessarily communicate well across the border. So there's a lot that we're talking about, a lot we're negotiating. It's, it's beautiful and I really appreciate it. Um, and then also I get to work on the Great River Report which is based on the ecos, um, based on the Ohanda Gullah Wadekwa as well. And all it is about is it's an ecosystem health report on the upper St. Lawrence. And we're looking at fish populations, water quality, uh, birds, uh, any, any data and information we get our hands on. And then we're writing this technical report, which is basically like a scientific article. Um, it actually is a scientific article that we will be publishing at some point. Um, but what's beautiful is we're also integrating this biocultural context to that, that narrative. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. I, I, I know I keep saying all of this work is beautiful, but let me tell you, the work in Aquazusn is, is gorgeous to me. And I really appreciate that I get to do this. But I work with the River Institute on this, Lee McGoffey, superstar, inspiration, helping me along this journey. We talk, we write, we read. There's so much good stuff happening here. And really, I think that this is one of the greatest examples of bringing that biocultural perspective together or bringing Western indigenous science together that two-eyed scene that people talk about or that um, Albert Marshall came up with. And the way we manifest that here is with the two a wampum, but it's a whole, whole larger discussion. And all of the work I do is informed by this concept of all my relationships or all my relations or what I like to call complex contact connectivity. And it's defined as the role of cultural and social processes as conceptually independent but mutually interdependent <laughs> yields interesting insights into the complex connectivity that comprise relations with biological foundations. Basically, we're really close with the land. And it, this was a really important process for me in my analysis and my research because what I was able to show is the interconnectedness across our value system with the landscape. And that it's it is all connected. But you know, as a scientist and somebody telling you it's all connected, it's all important. I'm like, how am I supposed to do this research? If it's all important, then nothing's important. If it's all connected, like how am I supposed to understand this? You know? And so this is just this is how I came to that place. And 
this is just kind of like a little bit of a focus into it, the way that complex connectivity expresses itself and these nodal connections to these different value systems. Um, but in particular, what I wanted to sort of draw attention to is like loss of species, loss of connection. It has this really resounding impact across our ecosystem and across our knowledge systems. It affects our stories. It affects our teachings. It affects so much of who we are. And so when I think about like how I'm approaching the work that I'm doing and thinking about the recommendations that come out of this work, we're trying to create legislation within our own community. We're doing community engagement. We're collaborative on a regular basis. We're addressing concerns. We're developing curriculum. We're, we're, doing, we're doing all things. And it's just informed and grown from right from where we are in this community. And you know, moving forward, why this work is so inspiring to me. And I will probably never see the end of this. I will work for the whole my whole life fighting for this environment. And um the work will continue and hopefully inspire future youth to do this. But what I just want to bring attention to is that our relationship with the environment, our relationship with our culture, with each other has been degraded so much. And I think of it as like a broken basket. But the beautiful thing is, is that that broken basket can be restored. And that gives me hope that like we can call everything back. We can call our knowledges back. And that's just part of this this really beautiful period of critical resurgence and reclamation of everything that we are unapologetically. And so now I'm available for questions. Uh, so I have one question that came in so far. Um, if anybody else would like to ask Ava a question, you can enter it either in the chat or in the Q&A box. We can answer both of them. So my question for you is about shoreline health. Um, and the question is, what has been your most successful way of reaching people about shoreline health? And what has been the most challenging hurdle in that project? So I haven't had super success. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think my greatest success is that like I actually did a restoration project and it's been successful. We planted like so many trees. We restored this landscape. We're going to keep monitoring it and we're getting more money to continue this work. Um, but also I'm sort of putting in, I put in this like recent proposal to look at It's like decolonial approaches to shoreline um, work. And so what I'm looking at is really bringing it to who we are in Aquazoste, like all my work, obviously. <laughs> but like, when I think about shorelines, I'm bringing in this issue of checkerboarding. So it's a really big, huge issue in indigenous communities is checkerboarding. And so what happened when we were put on reservations was land was dispersed to families and now what we have is we have families that have these properties and a misunderstanding in a way, like this is our land, we can do what we want with it without considering the impacts. Like a lot of this kind of brings in that colonial way of thinking of your relationship with the waters and what we're doing and, you know, residential schools, assimilationist tactics, like just brings in a lot of that stuff, right? Really, we weren't able to celebrate who we are probably for like, I guess like the last 20, like it's only been about 20 years, maybe 15, that we've been able to be just on our, our unapologetic selves, where we tell, where we say our names regularly, we correct people. But again, that's, that's what that is. But what I'm really interested in doing is approaching this family-centered approach to engagement. And that I'm trying to teach people about their shorelines and help them restore them. It's not that like, I think, you know, people that clear their shoreline, put a nice dock in, you know, are really proud of that moment, but they don't, they aren't realizing the impacts of that. And so I'm not here to drop the hammer on them and how dare you and here's a fine and, you know, you need to fix this. I want to help them. I want to teach them. These are the medicines that you have in the shoreline. This can contribute to our community. This is how you're helping hold on to that land that is real, like that is going to erode away because you just took the vegetation away um, and the implications of that kind of stuff. 
you know, the species at risk that are being affected. You know, just really thinking about this interconnected roles and responsibilities, putting language in there. And then the way that we're trying to measure that is with like shoreline um, health indices. And it's all about restorative. It's all about restoring that relationship. So we're bringing the language, we're bringing the teaching, the roles and responsibilities, trying to promote that. And then we're gonna get money to plant trees and do habitat restoration. Um, and that kind of happened, like, because for me, what we did with the last shoreline project is we planted trees. And for me, planting a tree or planting things is not enough. There has to be that extra level. We have to create a relationship with that landscape. That's, that's a part of our kinship network. And when you have that connection to it, it changes the way that you're going to move forward and like you're going to engage with it in the future. It doesn't mean that we're going to change everybody's mind. There's always going to be people that don't want to do it or aren't about our, what we're trying to do, but that's okay. You know, they're going to have kids someday that'll take over that property. Hopefully I can get into their brains too. But really trying this family-centered approach to education, like convincing okay. and engaging the whole group. So I know that was a really roundabout question. I have this really beautiful proposal that puts it in nice words. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hey. Um, I just had a whole bunch of questions come in, so we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but I will put them in a document and then Abe um, will have you answer them and then we'll put them out on social media. Um, I've got one more question for you uh, for right now, and that's, is there a trend toward being able to eat fish around Aquasasne once again? <laughs> so I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to say yes with an asterisk, okay? I believe the ecosystem is getting better, and there is indications that it is getting better. There is, like, research and data that supports this. Now, there is also that we do carry that concern that I can't just tell people to go get eat fish in the northern portion without having the data to support it. And what are the rates and what are the recommendations? So that's why I'm doing all this crazy work I'm engaged in, because I want to prepare people because we have a role, we actually have that responsibility to eat fish. Because when in eating fish and being in engagement with fish, that relationship, we learn a lot. We share values, we share teachings, we share language. There's so much that happens through the on the land. <clears throat> and so that's what's been missing and that's what we're trying to get back. I'm trying to reclaim our story, the narrative around the river, the narrative that currently is in our communities that our environment is bad. Uh, if you're going to eat, if you're going to be in the water, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, then you're going to get cancer, you're going to die. Anything goes wrong with you, it's the river, it's the contaminants. And <clears throat> that's a piece of the narrative, but there's also this really important part that we need to, I need to be there. So I still eat fish. Like I will mess up a, a you know a plate of uh, walleye nuggets any day, and I'm learning more about other fish and how to like consume them. Like you know we eat sturgeon here, we eat eel, we we do all of these different things, and you know that's a part of our responsibility. 